and have been able to vote. Uh, you know, I was always sort of frustrated with the limited number of options we had to pick from on the ballot um, and and the way that it seemed like politics were going. You know, everyone's frustration. If, you know, I cast my vote, it doesn't really matter because people who have a lot of money or, you know, who've been in the game for a really long time, you know, they're the ones who control it, and it doesn't matter what we do. So this year... Uh, I'm old enough, and I decided that I was going to be a third option for the voters, you know, that my my skills in design, you know, I'm a problem solver. Sure. That's what I do. So um, I want to put those skills to good use for people. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, let's just get to some topics so the folks can uh, become familiar with your ideas. Let's start right with the uh, thing that's on everybody's mind, the Ebola virus. What are your What are your thoughts about this? Your thoughts about Do we have the inf- infrastructure to take care of this? What are What are your general ideas? Uh, I, I do think that we are more than well equipped to handle it. Um, we know a few years ago with MRSA and, and the flu that we've we've had many, many, many more people die because of the flu and those types of things than we have with Ebola so far. And the fact that, you know, a little over 4,000 people is our current death toll, whereas with the flu outbreak, we lost over 200,000, that we do seem to have a pretty good handle on it. And it is, you know, a terrible disease, and we want to do everything we can to prevent it. But uh, um, the people that we have that we are treating, they're doing great. Um, and then we're helping other countries so that it's not continuing to spread. And, you know, I, I am quite confident that we have, that we have the situation under control, as, as it were, right now. Um, that we're doing a good job, and we don't necessarily have to close our borders and, and uh, quarantine people, you know, for forever to make sure that it doesn't turn into a, a large-scale um, epidemic. We are talking with independent candidate Cassandra Mitchell. She is running for the U.S. House of Representatives, 3rd Congressional District. Um, Cassandra, on a sort of health-related topic, let's jump right over to the Affordable Care Act. I want to cover a lot of topics with you, so if we're jumping around, I apologize. Uh, depending on who you ask, of course, this the, the Affordable Care Act is, is either a raging success or an abysmal failure. Where do you Where do you stand on that? Uh, I'm kind of in the middle. I think it did. It, it was it was not properly implemented. They didn't plan very well for rolling it out, and the legislation probably could, it could have been better, could have done more. But I the some of the things that it did, um, especially providing no copay care for uh, very young children and infants after they're born. Um, especially a lot of the, the no copay services that we are offered as women now, um, the fact that you can't be turned away for pre existing conditions, those types of things were were great. Um, and I'm so glad that those kinds of things finally happened. <laughs> you know, the company can no longer say you're pregnant, you're a pre pre existing condition, so we won't give you insurance. Um, those types of things. Now that being said, insurance is still very expensive. Um, I currently don't have insurance because I cannot afford it. Ah. And so I am, I'm like a lot of people, you know, like even, even with the Affordable Care Act, insurance is still not affordable enough for like myself to have insurance. Um, maybe when I get a new job and I'm making more money, eventually I could. <laughs> right. But, um, So there still is a lot of work that needs to be done. It it was a baby step in the right direction, but we still have a lot of work to do to making sure that that our health care is affordable for everyone. Speaking of making more money, uh, what what is your opinion about the economy? Is it improving? Uh, Who's benefiting? And then I have a follow-up question after that. Uh, Well, from where I'm at, I'm sort of close to the bottom of the pack, and, and you, from where I sit, you know, it looks like things have, have sort of stagnated, you know, they've leveled off. Um, we aren't seeing, at least in my area, you know, that many new jobs being created, um, and people who have been out of work are still having a hard time finding a job that will pay them a living wage so that they can, you know, keep a roof over their heads and food on the table for their kids. 
So what is your position about the minimum, raising the federal minimum wage? I, I think that it is possible that we should do it. And um, I had said this at a forum at Oak Ridge, you know, as if I were the CEO of a company or, or a manager, that if we needed to raise the minimum wage, that if I have to make a little bit less, so that my employees can keep a roof over their heads and food in their bellies, then I'm going to do that. That um, less, a little less selfishness and a little more let me help everyone else around me might be what our country needs right now to kind of help get out of the ditch. Do you think it's a um, possibility to create jobs addressing our infrastructure issues across the country? Definitely. We need new roads. We need roads to be fixed. We have our bridges are falling apart. Um, those definitely need to be fixed. We need you know, new energy sources to power all of these great cities and buildings and communities that we're we're trying to build and bring more jobs. And by fixing those type of things, basically, you know, a new New Deal that putting people to work, especially our veterans coming back from overseas, um, using their skills that they have learned to help here at home. Um, that, that is a great idea, and that's something that we need to look at implementing. Um, what is your position about the Veterans Administration? We've all heard the, the, the horrible stories. How can we stop this, and how can we treat our veterans with the respect that they deserve in the future? Well, uh, community awareness is, is part of it, but as far as the government goes, um, it seems like we're a little behind the times when it comes to technology and that that is something that we need as a country to be investing in, especially for our veterans, that their systems are up to date so that uh, their files and their requests can be processed in a quick and efficient manner. Uh, we need to make sure that ha everyone, and they have the computers, uh, that will that will do these things for them. Um, you know, they, that they have tablets, maybe. They can go on site instead of having backlogs of, of files and then all these ancient, you know, desktop machines to do all this on, that we should be running our VA and our government like a lot of the tech companies run in Silicon Valley. It's very efficient, and it costs less. If you do things the right way, the right time, you know, the first time around with with the right programs and the right technology. Uh, is there, uh, Cassandra, is there an American dream still? Uh, for my generation, I don't think so. Uh, for most of us, you know, graduating from college, just out of school, it's I have to find an apartment that I can afford and some job that will help me eat. I mean, that's really all we're worried about at this point. Uh, there's no, you know, I want to get a house in the suburbs. I want to do this. I want to do that. We're kind of, you know, it's at the point where we just have to survive. And occasionally if we get to go on vacation or, you know, get a new car, um, that, that's, that that's great. But it's not our priority. Is part of that uh, due to the affordability of college? And what are your thoughts about that in student loans? Well, my mother is actually a community college professor, and I've been through the community college system, and I love tech schools. I believe uh, wholeheartedly that not a, a four-year degree isn't for everyone. Um, you know, certain, certain professions, and, and you need more time, you need more training. But for a lot of the jobs, you know, a tech degree or two years at a junior college is more than enough to equip you with the skills you need to enter the workforce. And community colleges definitely, and, and tech, technical and vocational schools, are very affordable. Um, Four-year institutions, public ones, are, are becoming more so. Um, but the, the private, for-profit uh, college sector definitely has some work to do when it comes to affordability. Okay, again, we don't... Uh, have much time, so we're going to switch topics pretty quickly here. I'm speaking with independent candidate Cassandra Mitchell. She is running for the Uni United States House of Representatives from the 3rd Congressional District. Um, Cassandra, what is your thought 
on energy independence. Uh, this affects everybody every minute of the day. So what what are your thoughts about uh, um, energy and our needs and the direction we are headed? Would you support renewable energy? Those types of issues. Oh, definitely. Um, I you get some of my electricity from uh, North Dam, and that's definitely a renewable resource. Um, I love wind power, solar power. I know, you know, a lot of talk right now, it's, it's not really affordable, and part of that is because our battery technology is, isn't up to par. Um, you can't store for a reasonable price the amount of electricity you would need. I um, mean, and then, you know, one of the other arguments is, well, we don't get enough sun to just do solar or we don't have enough wind, but if we put all of these different systems in place to work together, depending on the weather and the time of day and all of those, you know, supplementing it with natural gas, that we um, we would be able to achieve energy independence eventually. Um, there's, you know, new research being done on uh, a road surface that would generate electricity when people drove on it. Um, that's pretty interesting. Yes. <laughs> I think we should investigate. Um, I definitely don't agree with fracking uh, and mountaintop removal, you know, where I'm at. It's it's terrible to see. Uh, we've had an increase in earthquakes and those types of things in the areas where they've been fracking and doing a lot of mining. Um, so that that is sort of an indicator that this is probably – not necessarily the best thing that we're doing as far as that route goes, but that's something we should be moving away from and exploring all of these other options that we have available to us. So your position on the Keystone Pipeline? I think I know the answer, but go ahead. Yeah, I know. I did not agree with the Keystone Pipeline. Um, given the fact that we've had an influx in the number of spills from the other pipelines already running through the country, um, and the response to them has been less than stellar, uh, it doesn't seem like building just another one and then keeping up the maintenance on it and everything is is going to be um, realistic. Another topic um, requiring our attention, I believe, is uh, the immigration policy in our country. Um, there's a border uh, a border fence that's half built. Would you support building the rest of it? Uh, what are your What are your other thoughts about? Immigration, immigration reform in general? Um, well, I'm fortunate enough to know someone who's actually going through the process right now. Um, and let me tell you, in high school, you know, we, we talk about the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, but we're never taught what the process actually is. And I sat down with him one day and asked him, you know, what, what did you have to go through to get here? And it was extraordinary. <laughs> Um, it cost him almost $10,000 in lawyers and fees just to be able to get his green card to come to the United States before he could even apply for citizenship. And he has to wait six years before he can apply to be a citizen. So it is a, a very complicated, very long, drawn out, a very expensive process to come to the United States. Um, and I, I don't think it should be that way. I think if you want to come here legally and you want to work and you want to pay taxes, then then we should be affording you the opportunity to come here. Where we have jobs, we have jobs that no one wants to do. Um, that that immigrants and and other people in the United States are more than willing to dive in and and do those kinds of do that work. Um, as far as the border goes, uh, physical fence might not be absolutely necessary for the entire thing. Uh, one of my ideas, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but the Kinect sensor that, that goes with an Xbox, they're cheap, and they do a lot of really cool things. They have infrared, they detect, the, they have facial recognition, they can see in the dark, um, they pick up sound. So one of my ideas is for, especially the very remote stretches of land, we could build uh, a digital fence, if you were, and then Border Patrol would be notified if there were people or, you know, things moving in this area, and they would get, you know, a text message that says, hey, at post number 52, we saw something. You need to come check it out. And also for the ranchers who are, you know, they're in fear, um, and the people who live in those very remote areas and along the border, that if something triggers on their property, 
or in their vicinity, that then they would also get a message that says, hey, there's something in the area, be aware, you know, Border Patrol is on its way to check it out for you. Um, that would be a pretty cheap and viable option, at least for keeping eyes in areas where it's not exactly possible to have people patrolling all the time. The uh, Middle East, as we know, is a morass of instability. Uh <laughs> The eyes of the world are, are on the Sunni jihadist extremist group ISIS or ISIL and on us. What are your thoughts about that current situation? It's, it's sort of, it seems like it's been a cycle of we arm rebels to fight the bad guys, but then the rebels turn into the bad guys, so we arm new rebels, and that, that pattern has to end. Uh, we can't keep um, unwitting, unwittingly manufacturing wars and conflict uh, by arming people in the Middle East to fight people, and then they then use those arms against us or their al- their former allies. Um, I, I like taking the approach of you know offering support as far as eyes and ears, surveillance that we're good at that we have really good technology when it comes to that. And our people are, are highly trained to do those types of things. And that those are good positions for us. But it, it isn't exactly our job to be world police. And Lord knows we cannot really afford it right now at this point in time. Um, so I, I don't, definitely don't support going in on the, uh, doing infantry at all. And... Um, it's, it's really tough to say, you know, what should we do? Should we sit back and, and watch, or should we, you know, go in and and do what we did in Afghanistan and try and fix everything again? But um, Well, I guess my esoteric question would be, why should we care? What happens in the Middle East? That is a humanitarian question. You know, as far as business goes, um You know, we do import some of our oil from over there, and so gas prices for us are a concern. But it's, you know, more of a humanitarian thing. How how much do I care about the, you know, thousands of people getting slaughtered every day? Um, Can you sleep at night knowing that that we aren't doing anything to stop it? And is there anything that can be done to stop it? We are speaking with independent candidate Cassandra Mitchell. She's running for U.S. House of Representatives. In the 3rd District. Um, as we close out here, Cassandra, tell us why you should represent this district. Well, being very young, I have a very different perspective uh, on how the world works, on you know all these old long-term conflicts that we've had between the parties, between other countries. Uh, we don't necessarily, and I certainly don't, hold all of the old grudges that some of the older generations have. And I have the added benefit of growing up in a digital age. So I have tech ideas. I have tech know-how to make companies more efficient, to make the government more efficient. I care a whole lot. <laughs> I'm just an average person. Um, you know, without insurance, trying to make it by to keep a roof over my head. So I know what everyone is, I know what a lot of people are going through. I know what it's like. And so being, you know, an average person and I have ideas, they might not necessarily be the best ones, um, but one vote is, is a vote. So if there's a bill, you know, that, that we as Tennesseans we don't want, or if there's an idea that we really, really want to support, then I have a vote to help get that passed or get that defeated. I mean, you know, like with the Occupy Wall Street movement, all it takes is one person. One person has to stand up and say, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and make a difference, and I'm going to try and change things. I and mean, then one of the things that I would really like to change is to see us get rid of this first pass the post system. Um, I support Fair Vote in their mission of trying to reform democracy in America um, and establish proportional representation and to try and get some of, to corral some of the money that's in politics and all of this old, old school influence that we have um, so that it, our country becomes 
goes back to being more democratic and that in the future when things come up, it's not just the voices of the few who have 20 years experience and, and the, you know millions of dollars, but it's the voices of the people that are being heard um, when it comes to voting on things. Well said. Is there uh, any other topic you would like to speak about that I, that I didn't ask you about? Um, well, there is one, and I personally, uh, when it comes to the topic of, you know, the legalization of cannabis in the country, um, I am not, a, I don't partake, never have, I actually don't even drink, um, but it is an everyone's problem. We spend a lot of money as taxpayers housing young people and minorities in for-profit prison systems, um, and it, it ruins a lot of lives for people who might have just made one stupid decision. Um, it has a lot of benefits when it comes to medical use. It, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, and, and it could be a great source of income to help make up part of our, our deficit in our country um, that we could be, you know, if we legalize it, it would create jobs, lots of jobs. You know, distributors, we need people to inspect the farms, we need people to grow it, we would need people to sell it. Um, you need, you know, pharmaceutical companies to create drugs from it. <laughs> but it is, it is a large industry that we could be, we have to, we can harness to help solve some of our, you know, economic and financial problems that the country is facing. Um, and it would still, you know, carry the same penalties. You cannot drive while under the influence of anything. And I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. So if you are caught under the influence of any kind of, you know, painkillers or, or cannabis, or alcohol, that those need to have harsher penalties than if you are at home and you, you know, smoke uh, a joint and then, you know, someone finds you with one on you the next day. But that, that is sort of ridiculous. <laughs> but um, but I, I really appreciate you taking the time to let me come on and, and talk. Well, thank um, you. We appreciate hearing from you. We, we appreciate your enthusiasm. And if voters want to learn more about you, where can they go for that information? Uh, my, I have a Facebook page. It is www.facebook.com slash unlocking America. And I have uh, some of my uh, notes up there on different topics. And it's always open. If you want to know more about something or I don't have something posted up there, then leave me a message and I will respond to you as soon as I possibly can. And again, this is independent candidate Cassandra Mitchell. She's running for the United States House of Representatives, 3rd Congressional District in Tennessee. Thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed speaking with you. Oh, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, and everybody vote today. Thank you, Cassandra. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Today is the last day for early voting. Uh, election day is Tuesday. I would like to say that I have missed my fellow host, David Davis, today. He has had back surgery, and he's recovering nicely. So everybody go on there, find him on the Facebook, and send him a good well wish. Uh, we will have a break next week, but hope to return soon. Again, this is Listen In. I'm Angela Miner, and thank you for your time today. Bye-bye. The old man entered not. Far away his voice is sweet now, and he sings his heart's desires. Where there are no church committees and no fashionable choirs. Rock.